I have something to tell you. I'm a necromancer. A necromancer? What do you mean? You have sex with dead people? Oh, no. Good God, no! What does it mean? You're not a forensic scientist. I thought you were a barista. Oh, I just do that during the day, to pay for necromantic night school. I'm trying to get my BA in necromancy so I can move on to a four-year college, do some graduate studies, get my doctorate, and join the necromancer's guild. Uh... Wait! That's not even the best part. It's the zombies. Okay. I do this little incantation thingy, right? And sprinkle some powdered yak testicles on the cadaver and presto, a reanimated corpse completely under my control. They exist only to serve my every whim, and they're nearly indestructible. It's awesome. What is the point within your creative process that you decide, more times than not, the character's fate? Honestly, I can't really pin that down. I'm a discovery writer, and I frequently direct in a similar fashion. I have an idea of where things are going, but I'm often surprised at the direction things take. There are a lot of factors to consider. Justice, um, my own sense of satisfaction. I really like it when people get what's coming to them. It's like a, you know, it's a good feeling. It's like, yeah, you know? Uh. On the other hand, it, it, sometimes that lack of closure uh, someone not getting what they deserve can leave you with a sort of hollow ache because your expectations weren't met, uh, which can leave people thinking about your story well after it's over. And that's a good thing. Once you have a character's fate decided, how often, give us a percentage, would you say that fate has changed? Oh my gosh, a percentage? Shoot. I'm gonna have to go default to 50-50. No, that's not fair. Uh, so once I've discovered the story, I'm not really married to the ideas, but I don't change them lightly. It all kind of really just depends on what's best going to serve the story. Uh, if an actor or anyone else on the creative team can convince me that their ideas, uh, their idea serves the story better, um, I probably usually resist it at first. Actually, I absolutely resisted at first, um, but after reflecting on the suggested changes, I have been known to come around. Um, yeah, so no, I'm going to stick with 50-50 on that one. What was the main reason for the change? Fans who love them convince you, you fall in or out of love with them, the story shifts while editing, or your actor has convinced you because it makes more sense to go the other direction. Reasons for the change. Uh, I've never changed a character's art because of fans. Uh, nothing I've ever made has ever had fans. Um, I fall in and out of love with characters all the time, so I can't really let that influence me. Uh, I, in fact, I frequently punish characters that I love uh, because I think putting characters through a ringer uh, is, a, is a good way to get your audience to love them too. Generally speaking, not just as a screenwriter and director, but also as an author, the story shifts during editing. Uh, or, or someone has convinced me to go another direction. But the story shifting during editing is a big one. Uh, because, like I mentioned earlier, I'm a discovery writer, and uh, the first draft of a screenplay or manuscript is basically me pulling the story out of the ether. Um, so yeah, it absolutely changes during editing because the process of, of the first draft is so freeform that when you go back through and review, uh, you got to make some changes, sometimes some, some drastic changes, and that's okay. That's, that's just part of the process. Tell us about one character you came particularly fond of or grew to despise that you flushed out more for your final product. How did it happen while on set? In rehearsals with the actor that forced rewrites during the editing because of the performance you saw on screen. Uh, so the character that springs immediately to mind is the interviewer from my current project, Enter the Mind Dungeon. Uh, in the script, written by Maddie Burdick and myself, the interviewer is a character that is very much sort of a blank slate. Uh, we have a few moments where we, uh, I think, sort of project some ineptitude onto the character. Uh, and a bit of him trying to hook up with one of the women in the group. So the actor, James Clark, had a lot of questions about how to play the character. 
Uh, and I think his original inclination was a sort of a Rod Serling like Twilight Zone type narrator. Uh, that wasn't really what Maddie and I were going for. Uh, he's more like a pretentious indie filmmaker. Huh, I wonder where we got the idea for that. Nothing like art imitating life, am I right? Anyway, uh, we were happy to let James improv and play with the character, and he successfully took this blank slate of a bland character and turned it into a hilarious and indispensable uh, addition to the film. Uh, so kudos to James Clark. He's a great actor, and you should hire him and give him money to be in your movie. And if I have time, another character that was changed in the screenplay drafting phase of things was the character of Penny's mother, Valerie, in Penny Palabras. Um, the mother in the comics was very one-dimensional, uh, with only really a handful of lines. Uh, we ended up getting Emily Rommel Shimkus of Journey Quest to play Penny's mother, uh, and the character uh, was almost pointless as is, so Sean Driscoll and I uh, fleshed out the character in the screenplay. Uh, partially because the character needed it, uh, and partially because we wanted to give Emily something more to work with. Because after filming one scene with her, we realized uh, that she was fantastic. Um, so we wrote at least two scenes into the script that weren't in the comic, because Emily was so awesome in the role and we wanted more of her. And then Emily and Dina, Dina plays Penny. Uh, Emily and Dina were so great together, like their on-screen chemistry, uh, it, it just made it awesome. And so yeah, I'm obviously going off book here, but we added a lot of scenes with uh, Penny's mother that I think uh, created dynamic between uh, this mother-daughter dynamic and this story of um, you know isolation and, and mental illness and ah uh, this see this is why I write things down because if I don't write them down then discovery writer like I said I don't know where I'm going. Give us a non-spoiler moment in which a character, actor, spoke out against your judgment and changed something benign, but that ultimately might turn into a big deal. Uh, I don't really have any examples that spring to mind about specific instances of this happening. Uh, I do remember there were a few times that Dina Ingley, who plays Penny Palabras, uh, came to me uh, on the set of Penny Palabras and said that she didn't think Penny would say certain things or that... Uh, some bits of her dialogue were a little clunky, uh, and pretty much every time she was right, uh, so we made the changes. Um, there might have been one or two instances where I was like, okay, you're not getting it, and I would uh, sort of explain the intent of a particular scene or a line uh, to Dina, and she got it, and we moved on. So uh, it, was, it was very much a give and take. She'd be like, uh, hey, uh, I don't like this, and I'd either be like, oh yeah, okay, cool, we can change that, no problem, or I'd be like, no, it needs to be like that, and here's why, and I would explain it. So, it's chill. I like to be easy. Uh, I, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, actors feel that they can come to me with this stuff, because uh, it's their art, too. Uh, this is something that we're all making together. It's, it's not just one person's vision, unless you're Terrence Malick. The current project I'm working on is called Enter the Mind Dungeon. It's a feature-length mockumentary about adults addicted to playing Dungeons and Dragons. Second edition, what up? See, the people in the study believe they're participating in a research study to find a cure for their condition, but it turns out the guy conducting the study is actually a mad scientist and they're all unwitting pawns and his nefarious machinations. The script was written by Maddie Burdick and myself and we also wrote Dead Drift together. Our inspiration for the story was a lifelong love of Dungeons and Dragons, fantasy role-playing, and all kinds of gaming, and sci-fi, geek, fantasy nonsense that we love.
So, uh, my team and I have spent the last few months shooting some content from Enter the Mind Dungeon in order to make a sizzle reel and do something I've never done before. Crowdfunding. That's right, we're gonna beg people for money to make our movie. Part of the reason we've chosen to go this route is that we want to be able to pay everybody that works on the movie. Actors, crew, even ourselves. And I don't have enough money to finance the thing out of my own pocket. So we're going to beg people just like you for money. Which one of these is a D4? It's the one that's shaped like a caltrop. It's important to remember that these are normal people like you and I. They're suffering from a very real affliction. These are not monsters. You take 33 damage. You would not find them in Mordenkainen's Tome of Foes. I shapeshift into a dire octopus. Ouch. Look, I, I have to take this, please. Can you even see my unicorn from there? My throwing hammer gets a plus two against fairies. I throw six daggers. Wu Tang Pa! It's a, an escape, a release, a rush. The rush I get when I get to drive my mace into a kobold stupid little skull, you know? I don't think any of us have a problem, necessarily. Except maybe Calliope. I'm a Capricorn. Duh. <laughs> Would anybody care for some elven wine? This condition has been dubbed AODDS, or Adult Onset Dungeons and Dragons Syndrome. Has uh, Dungeons and Dragons affected your career? It hasn't. Still a plumber. Level one. AODDS strikes without mercy, leaving tragic victims straining to maintain some semblance of normal life while trapped in the dungeon of their own minds. And then, out of the shadows of the alleyway creeps. That same dog you saw from before. Ooh, can I roll to see if he's a good boy? You don't have to roll. He is a good boy. A Dr. Leo Flynn has been studying the syndrome for the past 15 years. And despite losing his funding several times within that period, he continues to investigate. Beholder, dwarf berserker, bag of holding, dwarf berserker, banana split, oh, displacer beast, dwarf berserker. My family just is <laughs> as rewarding as Dungeons and Dragons. But you love them, right? Who? Your family. Okay. I'm a single mom, three kids, and I work two jobs just to make ends meet, which is all oh, this. <clears throat> but Gwendolyn, my dark elf rogue, she doesn't have any kids. Does anyone mind if I share my erotic interracial fan fiction? It's about Gwendolyn, Aaron Rodgers, and Russell Wilson. Uh, yes, I might. No, just stop. Why? Because Wilson is black and Rogers is white. No, because it's two dudes. No, it wasn't. It's interracial because Rogers is a human, Wilson is a halfling, and Gwendolyn is a drow. Yeah. So it's called Fifty Shades of Greyhawk. <clears throat> One day, a tall, handsome ranger with a magnificent mustache rode out of the north. His name was Aaron of the Green Bay. If you're interested in following along with our progress on Enter the Mind Dungeon, you can do it at enterthemindungeon.com or facebook.com slash enterthemindungeon. The tentative plan is to launch our quest for money in March, but that may change. It may be April, or who knows? <laughs>